have you been able to think about what we chatted on earlier on while I was going over all the IT issues we have faced today. So we were talking about the impact of this statement of U equals U for people and women living with HIV. So you answered that statement while I was trying to fix my IT issues. Have you answered that statement? And for those for drug users, Veronica. Hello, Javier. No, I I don't know if anybody else in the panel answered this already, but regarding people using drugs, U equals U is has a huge impact if we were able to get information about other issues first, because when we talk about criminalization, and the previous speakers mentioned this, they mentioned this criminalization just for having or living with HIV, and this is a stigma. So now I am undetectable, this criminalization regarding people living with HIV. Maybe you have transmitted this to me. There were even legal cases and people were prosecuted for this. But in our case, this, we call this, this is a criminalization using substances, people who have drugs and they are not visible. So maybe the impact well, if you look at this in different trials or metrics, well, we cannot measure the impact actually because it's very difficult to get through people who use psychoactive substances because users are part of the key populations when we say that they are not key populations. Well, I believe that being a woman, I may say this, one of the first and most vulnerable populations are women especially if they are pregnant or when they were pregnant. And now today there is elderly people, the same applies to elderly people. We have no chances of getting HIV if we are elderly. Well, users, drug users, the point is that, well, sometimes they get lost. I was really impacted by U equals U, this statement, because they mentioned that 70% or that many heterosexual people who use drugs, I, they don't even need to be illegal users to be criminalized. Drug users are criminalized. I, in many countries, alcohol is not penalized and it's one of the substances that increases transmission risks and it also increases stigma. And of course, U equals U, it's okay, it cannot be transmitted. HIV cannot be transmitted, but there are other sexually transmitted diseases, so condoms must be used. But without this burden of stigma, maybe there would be more trust. At least there is one less item one, one reason for not being criminalized. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. So, thank you, Veronica. And now Amru said this clearly, that the goal of this campaign is to get people to learn about this, to become aware, because this has a huge impact on vertical transmission during pregnancy, breastfeeding, delivery, if the delivery cannot take place in a safe place, there are many, many consequences. And many healthcare systems in the region are not aware of this, or maybe they have issues because of religious reasons, reasons that this, for example, they are against abortion too. So what do you think, Simon, about this U equal U campaigns targeting HS? age and gay populations well sorry msm populations i would like to go back to something veronica said and something the speaker said u equals u in latin america i believe the value of this campaign it's a transformational effect because it gives back 
independence and autonomy to the people. And this has a huge impact on the decisions you make regarding your intimate relationships, social relationships. This is not well documented, but it's there where we'll have the biggest impact. It helps reducing stigma. Well, this was clearly explained, it's very important, but in the, pay, in the case of the gay community, it puts everybody on equal footing rather than the use of antiretroviral treatment. So we can clear easily start talking about sexuality, about our bodies, our sex practices, because many of our sex practices were almost, were never discussed, were never even considered if you had HIV, for example, not using condoms. So this is statement of e, U equals U is very important for our sexuality because sexuality is still a taboo. So many groups are fostering transpho transphobia mis uh, misogynous, and they are usually taking autonomy independence from the people. And as Veronica said, there are layers of oppression that are building up one on top of the other one. So in the community, in the gay community, this statement brings about discussions which were not with which people were not at ease. They are still not easy, but they were not taking place in the past. So we can talk about sex, about a more real sex, sexual health. I, um, go, I have a different position and at Gay Latino, we have talked about this early on when we talked about PrEP and U equals U. There were several taboos that would crop up that were related to our own gender constructions or constructs, actually. And again, this is related to a hierarchy of certain sex practices, which were more primitive, where the active partner is better than the passive one. So we are now able to talk about this honestly and openly within the community. And this leads us to discuss other issues which were not in our agenda in the past. So we are again talking about sexual and reproductive rights and what this means for us. Somebody said that stigma will not go away if society does not change, and this is true. And from our point of view, stigma related to people living with HIV, it's a stigma that we have inherited from, oh, it's related to sexuality. So if HIV was transmitted such, such as COVID, we wouldn't have as many problems as we had when talking about prevention, but as it is as STD, where we have this stigma, we cannot talk about sex, we cannot promote the independence of our bodies, so we always have this issue in the background, which is feeding and supporting other stigmas. Now with U equals U, we can talk in the community about this, and we may dream about things which, which we could never dream about in the past. And this will be it. Javier speaking, thank you, Simon. This is not the day of technology for me. I would like to apologize because I forgot to introduce the speakers and the people who have been, who are involved in many, many, working in many groups in Latin America. And there are people from other parts of the world who don't know our panelists. The latest one was Simon Hassel, who is the coordinator of Gay Latino, a network of gay and other MSM from Latin America and the Caribbean. Sorry, speaking Caribbean. He's from Paraguay, and he is also the founder of a huge organization called Somos Gay. The previous speaker was is a friend from Argentina, Veronica Russo. She's right now working at the National Institute Against Discrimination, but she's a regional activist working in the area of people who use recreation, who use drugs, drug users. And the first speaker, I am introducing them backwards, 
is another close friend, Yuseli Flores. She has been working many, for many years in Peru with people living with HIV, and she's one of the people leading the Latin American network of people living with HIV AIDS from Lima, Peru. And now the fourth member of the panel, well, she will be very lucky because I will introduce her first, and after that, I will ask her a question. It's okay. So Giseli, sorry. I'll go to Alicia, and after that, we'll go back to you. Alicia Kruger, she's Brazilian. She's a member of the Brazilian Professional Association of Transgender People in Brazil. And she can share with us the views and opinion of the impact of U equals U, undetectable equals untransmissible. But and I would like to go back to what Mauro said, which are the structural barriers that prevent people who have more issues to have access to care, starting with testing in our countries, including Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay, and Peru. There are many people who don't know if they are positive or not, so they don't have access to care or treatment to protect their quality of life, but they cannot become untransmissive, untra people who don't transmit the disease. So, Alicia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Javier, Alicia, I'm Alicia Krieger. I'm a pharmacist. I'm the head of the association working for the health of transgender people. The Professional Association for Transgender Health. I would like to apologize for my combination of Portuguese and Spanish. For trans people, we have to talk about structural barriers, very specific ones. I live in a country where homophobia and transphobia are crimes, but Brazil is a country where more trans people are killed all over the world. So we have many, many rights, but we don't have access to education, to health. So very early on we die because we are killed by a system that is cisgender, where professionals, healthcare professionals, have many prejudices against transgender people. The government doesn't support us. We are, transphobia is criminalized, but transgender people, they are still facing different kinds of stigma and prejudice. Being undetectable is not only related to the use of drugs, of agents. I'm a pharmacist. I work as a pharmacist, and I, like I say this quite easily because in order to have access to treatment, to PrEP or to PEP, you need a positive social environment. You need the money to be able to pay for the ticket, for the bus ticket, to go to the hospital to get the medicines. So he, Brazil has a very well-known universal public health system, which is very affected by the COVID pandemic, and trans people are the ones that are most affected because a survey by an association in Brazil has shown that trans people in Brazil, over 90% of the transgender people in Brazil are sex workers. So during the night and during the day, well, they work, they are sex work, so they don't have time to go to the healthcare centers uh, when they are open, when they are providing services in the morning and the afternoon. So we should think of a specific healthcare system with specific approaches for transgender people. In Brazil, we have specific services aimed at transgender people for the transition, for the body transition, body changes, that is outpatient, outpatient clinics. They are free, they are part of the healthcare system and they provide hormones, prescriptions, and they also provide assistance for STDs. In the same place where we provide outcare health, we provide assistance for STDs. We work together to refer people from one side to the other one, to refer trans people who need to go through a body transition 
through hormones, they receive psychological assistance, but they also receive information about PrEP. We are using telemedicine for some people and healthcare system uh, workers are calling on these people, but there are many structural barriers. In Brazil, for example, we have 5,500 municipalities, cities, and we only have 28 specific services, healthcare services for transgender people. Hormones for transgender people are given out only at few places, so there's not a good supply of hormones or char. Uh, prejudice, as we say, in Brazil, stigma is are very important. Primary health care facilities, which solve easy issues, for example, a headache, they are not aimed specifically at transgender people, but transgender people face more obstacles. So undetectable, well, we cannot think that just by using a pill we will solve all issues because transgender people are not encouraged to use this. So we have hormones and care and char for prevention and treatment through those two elements we may improve access of transgender people to the healthcare system and we need a government that supports us in this respect. Thank you very much. And these cross-sectional aspects, let alone COVID, were the clandestine position of sexual workers is having a huge impact. You cannot take your treatment with an empty stomach. Transition, well, is not the best word, but I understand what you mean. Kiseli, well, I thought you were talking, but you were not. What is the impact of E U equals U among women living with HIV? And obviously, you can also take a different standpoint if you want. Thank you, Javier. First of all, I'd like to thank my colleagues who are also part of this panel, and I'd also like to thank you for having invited me to be part of this important session. I'd like to talk about the challenges we face in terms of accessing U equals U. And I'm going to go straight to human rights based approach. And I think, well, you know what my style is. I think that the nations are responsible for this in Latin America, especially in the Andean region, the states, the governments have become blind to human rights-based approach. We have strategies which are very basic that were used in the 90s or mid-90s when some of us got our diagnosis. I remember 1996 when I got my diagnosis and now, and if I draw a timeline, it seems as we're still in the same place. And this is related to the responsibility of states the governments are the ones who break all our rights. And I should mention that in order to achieve the 1990-90 goals, in order to achieve the last undetectable goal, we first have to achieve the, the other goals. But there are lots of gaps. Apparently, the governments are providing a perverse response but not providing access to healthcare services. And they preferably, healthcare should be provided under any circumstances. And these circumstances, now that we are in times of pandemics, situation has to become stronger, better, but far from this, what governments have done, or government officers have done, is to hide away. We've, been, we've seen a significant increase of women living with HIV whose rights have been, whose rights have been violated. And I'm talking about all genders because there is no sexual health 
care services, violence has become deeper, sexual violence has become a more serious issue, and this healthcare system is not ready to provide the right response in times of COVID. We have tried to find testing for women during the epidemics, during the COVID epidemics, because of personal and family reasons, I've been going back and forth from one city to the other, and I've seen, I've been able to perceive the deficiency of the healthcare system. So in COVID circumstances, women, HIV, people living with HIV, have really been significantly affected. Their rights have been violated. And this is something that we that has to be worked out one of the speakers said no more excuses but we're hearing an increasing number of excuses related to treatment so who is promoting discrimination and stigma the government itself the government itself is not caring for the rights of people the states are the ones who should do away with stigma gender violence, stigma against people living with HIV, because we have not seen any aggressive campaigns that show that HIV is not transmitted. HIV is acquired through a certain road in Latin America, and especially in the Andean region, in very conservative areas where we have governments that don't want to provide comprehensive education, where we have conservative people who are part of public policies, that prevents us from dreaming of U equals U or the end of the epidemic. There are no aggressive campaigns if the states are not involved in the development of these initiatives. What happens with indigenous peoples, with the communities in the Amazonia, where people are also exposed to these risks. And cultural adaptation has not been considered either. The governments think that what works in the capital cities will also work in the further away communities. And that's not the case. I don't want to blame society. I don't want to blame our people or our population. I think that the state is to be blamed. They are the ones who have to ensure access to our rights. We need to have access to justice. We need, we have rules and regulations that really neglect the universal statement on human rights. In Peru, as in many other countries, we still have to do the HIV test to pregnant women. And this really violates women's rights and it also allows for violence. Many women in our countries, from the very first laws we had, violence saying, I have HIV because it was diagnosed when I got pregnant. As a result of that, intimate sexual violence has increased and women are not cared for by the government. So women are criminalized. People living with HIV are criminalized. We cannot keep moving forward towards you equals you if all these other gaps related to the first 90, testing, diagnosis, the second and the third 90s, we will not be able to move forward if we do not fill those gaps. If we don't work together, this is not going to work and we'll never be able to have it. And how come that in countries such as ours, vertical transmission is being treated and as we used to treat things in the old times, we have new aspects which have to be incorporated, bio and social aspects which have to be incorporated in the response strategies. So the, this state stigma, state-based stigma. Thank you very much. 
we've only been given five minutes, but we will have to close any time. I think Giseli has covered many areas. So we're not doing the necessary number of tests, just like COVID. There is no access to ARV drugs. There is restricted supply of PrEP. There is lots of bureaucracy and delay in terms of treatment HIV people. So I'd like to give you one minute. I apologize for that. Veronica, Simon, and Alicia, whose Portuguese and Spanish is very good. I'll give you one minute each. Well, since I only have a minute, I first like to thank the Institute against thank the Institute against discrimination for giving me the chance to work with them the Latin American Network for Human Rights and for the Rights of Drug Users is also thankful for the support we're getting. Now that we're joining the regional organization of people living with HIV, we will be able to promote our organizations and we also need to know that we are part of a key population. I live with HIV and I'm a drug user and as many members of my organization, now the Argentina Network of Drug Users is the only network in America, Latin America and the Caribbean. We are affected by the same things that affect all these communities. There are sexual workers, there are gay young people, transgender women. They may belong to each of those communities, but if they use drugs, they are also part of another community. So this is a cross-sectional approach. In order to talk about damage and risk reduction, we have to consider that this policy was created for HIV AIDS reduction among vulnerable populations. So the members of these populations use drugs and they cannot say it because they will be sent to jail. So as a result of COVID, people had to leave their homes because access to drugs is illegal and they cannot be part of a withdrawal, drug withdrawal plan because that's not allowed. So I think that since we're getting more rights for populations, gay populations who can now get married, who now have right to their own gender identity, I think we have to do away with the criminalization of drug use. This will also gives us right, and this will not mean that there will be a larger number of drug users.